أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسوله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to the first of our series, Women in Islam. Um, I want to ask you guys a question. Um, what, are some, what are some characteristics or some actions that you've heard of growing up as a very pious Muslim woman? Like you've been told that this is what a very pious Muslim woman does. Can you guys throw out any ideas that you've heard? When I was growing up, I recall uh, somewhat of a narrative, not necessarily taught by my parents, Alhamdulillah, my parents didn't teach this type of a narrative, but it is something that I had heard in my communities, uh, in my masajids even, from, from some of my you know, teachers here and there. And the idea was that these are the things that make a Muslim woman a very pious, good, religious Muslim woman. And that was that she should stay at home. That is the best place for her. And she doesn't need to be involved in things really outside of the home. The best place for her is the home and that's where she should stay. That's what makes her a better, pious Muslim woman. That she shouldn't take on a career, she shouldn't take on a job. That her life should be only as a mother or a housewife and that is what is what one should aspire to and should not aspire to do anything above and beyond that because that is going outside of her realm. Um, that she should not travel alone. That whenever she travels, even if it's somewhere close by, she should always have someone with her. That makes her a more pious religious Muslim woman. That she should not talk back when someone talks to her. That she should not, um, she should not have firm opinions and strong stances on issues. That she should be, like you said, slightly submissive. That she should, um, she, sh she has no opinion or ability to divorce if she's in a relationship that is not good for her. If she's in a marriage that is not good for her. Um, there's an interesting quote that's, that's written in some books of Islamic literature. And in the books it says, um, it is from a wise man. Oh, I think it Battery's done. Oh. Is it still working? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so in the books it says um, that this is quoted by a wise man, but there's actually no author to this quote. It just says, قيلة, uh, it's said from a wise man that the, the best woman, the best Muslim woman, only leaves her home two times in her life. The first time is from her home to her father, uh, from her father's home to her husband's home. And the second time she would leave her home is from her husband's home to her grave. This is a quote actually written in some books of Islamic literature. Again, like I said, there's no author to this quote. But it is one of those quotes that spread like wildfire. People make memes out of it and they spread it on Facebook thinking that this must be perhaps a quote of the Prophet or a quote of a well-known scholar and it, it must be what Islam teaches. But when I looked up, I tried to find this quote, I tried to look for it. I found it in a book of Islamic literature, but it said the author is unknown. It's unfortunate that ideas like this are being spread and, and thought of as this is what Islam says about women. This is how a woman should act. In reality, um, we've been given an idea of women. We've been given a narrow, narrow narrative of what women really were like at the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If we were actually to look back at the seerah, if we were actually to look back into the ahadith and read the stories of women and see the actions that the women did, it would paint a very, very different picture from what some people tell us is the role of women um, in Islam or are the actions that are allowed for a woman in Islam or the characteristics that are allowed for a woman in Islam or the aspirations that are allowed for a woman to have. It's very different when you actually go and learn and look into the seerah and look into the ahadith. Um, you know, there's, um, whenever we're, we've been in Sunday school, oftentimes, we find that we don't have very many female Muslim role models to look up to. Whenever we hear stories of the seerah, we hear of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Umar radiallahu anhu. But here's a quick question. 
what is the name of the wife of Amr radiallahu anhu? Did we ever learn it? It was never written in our, in our history books, in the ones that we've learned. What is the name of the wife of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu? We don't know. These stories are not told to us. And it's not that the stories don't exist. They are sitting there in books of history, in the Arabic language, not translated, unavailable to the masses of people. And it's only after, only after having gone and studied the Arabic language that I was able to look into these books, unlock this treasure of women, hidden gems, sitting in our history, which gave us, which painted a completely different picture of what women were really like in the, at the time of the Prophet And I don't believe that this narrow narrative that we were given is necessarily an agenda that was against women. I don't believe that that was the, the um, intent of our scholars. Honestly, when they taught about women, they taught what they thought was most important, fiqh of women. They taught us the fiqh of menstruation. They taught us the fiqh of how a woman should dress. They taught us the fiqh of um, you know, what a woman should fast and not fast, and her pregnancy, and different issues like this, things that our ulama thought were important to teach. The other things that they didn't teach, it doesn't mean that they wanted to hide that necessarily, but they just perhaps didn't think it was very important. With, with a lack of female scholars, with a lack of people who, who really care about a certain issue, then you will have a void of knowledge that is not passed down from generation to generation. So while that knowledge is there, sitting in books that were written hundreds of years ago, the lack of people who thought that this was important knowledge made the, narrow, made the narrative that we know about women narrower and narrower and narrower. So it's time we open up our eyes and see what really truly was the narrative or the, the story of women at the time of the Prophet So there's an interesting book. Um, it's a, an amazing resource that inshallah I'll be using throughout the class, um, which is called Tahrir al-Mar'a fi Asr al-Risala which means the liberation of women at the time of the message. And the actual intent by, of this book by, by the author, um, uh, Sheikh Abu Shukka, it's, it's, he's a male scholar, and what he had actually decided to do was he said, I'm gonna go through the, all the uh, uh, authentic ahadith from the Sahih Sitta, the six authentic books of ahadith, and I'm gonna try to write a seerah of the life of the Prophet وسلم, a book of the life of the Prophet وسلم, using only authentic ahadith. What he ended up doing is as he started on this journey to write this book, he started to notice in the hadith something that would pop up a lot that really didn't fit with what he had learned throughout his life. So him being a scholar, being a teacher, he had learned about the fiqh of women. Like I said, they learn about the hayd, the menstruation. They learn about the aura of a woman and what she must cover and what, uh, how, what she can cover in front of men versus women versus mahram, etc. All these rules about women, the fiqh of women. But he had not actually learned or he had not been taught the actual story of what the women were really like. And so when he started reading these ahadith and reading them more in detail, he started seeing nuances in these ahadith that no one had really paid attention to before. And what he saw was he got a huge, huge, greater picture of the insight to what the women were really like, how they acted, how they interacted with other people, how they were people who were in the market, some buying, some selling how they were women who were nursing men on the battlefield, even a certain woman was on the battlefield herself, how there were women who supported their husbands. These were stories he learned from looking deeper into the ahadith, looking at those parts of the hadith that no one thought may have been really um, important to share. Maybe they got the part about when the menses started and ended or what the, the piece of cloth, how long it had to be. That may have been what was transmitted through books of fiqh. But when you really go into the hadith and the seerah and you look at their lives, it's a very different picture. And so he changed the direction of his book and even the name of his book from a seerah of the life of the Prophet ﷺ to Tahrir al Mara fi Asri Risala, the liberation of the women at the time of the message. And so I want to give you a few examples. It's, it's a six volume book. So imagine six volumes worth of what women were like 
that you didn't you didn't think that they were like this, that you thought that they were some way some other way, but actually this is what they were like. Just six volumes telling us about the lives of the women around the Messenger Sallallahu in the life of the Messenger Sallallahu while he was there observing them doing this and not not rebuking them for this or that or this action or that action. And so from his findings, here are a few gems that I can share with you. Number one, he said there were at least 300 mentionings in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim alone where it showed that women and men were interacting with one another within the, within the realm of the shari'i conduct, meaning they, were, they had the correct adab, they had the correct akhlaq, they were doing whatever they were doing for a specific purpose. They, they, uh, they were wearing the correct, uh, um, they were all covering their awrah, they were wearing what was correct shari'i. And there were 300 interactions where men and women were together in the same place, be it a walima, be it in the market, be it uh, in the masjid, on the battlefield, etc. Et and these are just from Sahih Bukhari alone, 300, um, more than 300 instances of, of interaction. Which means it was normal, it was natural. They were in a society where men and women actually did have to interact with one another. So maybe it's important that we go and look into these stories and see how did they interact? How were one another um, treating um, each other? How did the genders interact? He also mentions that there were women who observed the Fajr and Isha prayer in the Masjid of the Prophet What is significant about Fajr and Isha prayer? What does it look like outside? It's dark outside. Fajr time, it's dark, pitch black. Aisha time, it's dark. But there were women, married and not married, who were traveling to the masjid on foot, by camel, however they needed to get to the masjid, because they felt that they were a valued part of their community, that it was important for them as women to attend Fajr in the masjid, to attend Isha in the masjid. This was at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, which means he was encouraging women to come to the masjid. Which means he was encouraging women to go in the dark of the night to still come to the masjid because he said that this was good for them as well. And yet if we look at our societies today, how many of our, how many of our family members would encourage women to go to, pr to pray Fajr at the masjid, to pray Isha at the masjid? Immediately we'd say, oh it's dark, that's unsafe. Or we'd say, no you know what, it's not really important for you as a woman to go. If the men and the family can go, but the women, it's not really important. But was that what the Prophet ﷺ was apparently teaching or preaching? If it said that women were regularly going to the masjid for Fajr and Isha, that paints a different picture than what we expected. It is also narrated that there was a woman who memorized Surah Qaf from the mouth of Rasulullah ﷺ himself, meaning that she attended the masjid so often and had heard him recite this surah so often that without actually having had it in front of her and trying to memorize it herself, she had attended the masjid so often that she memorized Surah Qaf just from the Prophet Sallallahu continuous recitation of it in the masjid during the prayers. There's also an example of, of women who spent the last 10 nights of Ramadan in I'tikaf in the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu which means women spending the night overnight in a masjid at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu And you may say, well, who are these women? Um, maybe they were not married, so then, so then their husbands didn't have any say in it. These were the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who started this, who started this tradition. And then the, the Sahabiyat, the female Sahaba, took, took this tradition as well and they continued it. They got permission from the Prophet Sallallahu while he was alive. And after his death, they continued this tradition of spending 10 nights in i'tikaf, in the masjid of the Prophet We also have examples of, and, and, and numerous examples, and this may be an idea that you, you've not heard of before, where there were women and men in the masjid of the Prophet without a barrier at all in between the men and the women. And this is something that is uh, when you think about it today, we say, like, how can a masjid exist without a barrier? Like, how astaghfir Allah is that masjid, right? Like may they, may they seek, seek forgiveness for what they're trying to create. But the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ did not have a barrier in between the men and the women. You have to understand that the Prophet ﷺ was fighting against a culture. He was fighting against a culture at that time. And you could, you could just call it a culture. But it was actually just the human nafs. It, it's a disease of the human nafs. It's a disease of the human heart 
to sometimes want to place some group of people above another group of people, whether it be gender, whether it be race, whether it be age, religion, etc., whatever it may be. That's a, it's a part of human nature to try to put one group above the other. One wants to feel better, more powerful, wants to have um, more freedom than the other, than the other um, demographic. And so this was something that existed at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Before Islam came, if we look at the status of women, you will see that in the Jahiliya time, women were, they were treated as property, as commodities. And so it is even said that women were inherited from one man to another. And so the idea was that um, if a man had multiple wives, after he passed away, those other wives would be inherited by his sons. Not, not, not the mothers of those, those boys, but the boys who were not um, children to those women would inherit those women as their own. So women were actually treated as property at the time before the Prophet ﷺ. There's also, though it wasn't very common practice, the practice of daughters when they were born being buried alive in Jahiliya time because they thought that this was not something valuable for us as a family. This, this child, this daughter is not going to bring money into the home. She's not going to be able to help and bring wealth into the home. And so they may, in the past they did, bury their daughters alive because they thought it was not something of value. They were not something of value. So this is the culture that the Prophet ﷺ um, brought Islam into. This was the Arabia that Allah sent Islam into. And so definitely they were fighting against a culture. And when you're fighting against a culture, you've got to make stances that that push against something and it may make people uncomfortable but at least it was trying to make the it was trying to make what what people had created one above another it was trying to equalize it to some to some degree so when the prophet saw someone allah sent down ayat to to glorify the woman where allah would say in the quran in many places it says um, it uses the human masculine plural which is for example the word muslimuna the word muslimuna it actually in it encompasses both men and women. It means Muslims. Like when I say Muslims right now, it means both men and women Muslims. The word Muslimuna is a masculine plural, but it includes both men and women. Yet Allah still in the Quran in many ayat decides to use the feminine plural as well to tell the people that look, I know you didn't consider women valuable in the past, but I am revealing ayat to show that there is value. You need to put them at a place that is more, um, that is more appropriate than where you're putting them at. And so Allah revealed ayat that said, Al-Muslimuna wal-Muslimat. The Muslim men and the Muslim women. Wal-Mu'minuna wal-Mu'minat. Wal-Qanituna wal-Qanitat. Right? The at at the end of the word is saying the Muslim women as well. The Muslim believers as well. And so Allah made a point in His revelation to put the woman at a higher level because they had been put down for so long. And the Prophet ﷺ, by, by, by making the women allowed in his masjid, and then also not erecting a barrier, he was making a point that the women are valued parts of our community, that the women are allowed in the masjid for all prayers, even the prayers when it's dark outside, and that if you have a problem, you want to push them away from the masjid, I'm not even going to let you put a barrier here. You're going to have to deal with how to interact with them in a respectful manner. You're going to have to deal with that because they are here and they are here to stay. And that was the, what the Prophet ﷺ was trying to implement in his masjid. And if we truly believe that the Prophet ﷺ's model was the perfect model for us, then we would see that there is wisdom in what he did. That there is wisdom in the way that he set up his masjid, in the way that he treated women in his community, in the way that he valued women. And it's interesting, like going back to this idea of the, the culture that was pushing against women. You can say that at the time of the Prophet Sallam, yes, he was, he was trying to um, fight against this culture. But to show you just how strong that culture is, very shortly after the death of the Prophet Sallam, there was a conversation that happened between um, the grandson of Umar ibn al-Khattab and his son. So this is Abdullah ibn Umar and his son are having a conversation. And so Abdullah ibn Umar is quoting the Prophet ﷺ to his son and saying, the Prophet ﷺ said, do not forbid your female, your female, the female slaves of Allah from the houses of Allah. لا تمنعوا أما الله من مساجد الله من مساجد الله. Do not prevent the female women from the masjids of Allah. 
So he's teaching this to his son. And what does his son say? Again, this is very close. The time of Prophet Sallallahu was just a generation before. His son, his son says, No, but surely I will prevent the women from my home from the masjid of Allah. He just, he just refutes what his father says and says, No, I'm, I'm, I know what you just said, but I'm, I'm not going to let my women into the masjid. And then it says in the books, it says, فَسَبَّهُ سَبَّنْ عَظِيمًا Then his father cursed him a great cursing, like, How dare you say what you just said? I just told you that the Prophet ﷺ said, do not forbid your women, and you say you're going to forbid your women from coming to the masjid. So if you want to see how strong that culture, that, that ideology was to put one above and, and one below, it was there just a generation after the Prophet ﷺ had tried so hard to fight against this culture. One generation passed, and the grandson of Umar, Umar, Umar ibn al-Khattab is saying this, that no, I know it was said, but I just, I won't let my women into the masjid. I don't want to do that. And so his father cursed him. He said, how dare you say something like that? I just told you what the Prophet ﷺ said. If that culture existed in the time of Jahiliyyah, if it existed at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, then surely it means it's a human problem. It's a human problem and surely it exists today. And so when we see in our masajid that there are, there are, there are people who want to put one above and one, another, one below, then we just see that this is just a replication of that, that human uh, disease that we have. And it's not only in terms of the masjid, there's so many diseases we have of the human heart where different races are put at a different level. Different people of different ages are put at a different level and different people of different genders are put at a different level. But Islam came to try to equalize that, to try to show people that inna akramakum indallahi atqaqum that the most noble of you all, from men and from women, from any race, from any age, indallahi with Allah, according to Allah, is the one who has the most taqwa. He didn't talk about gender in that, in that ayah. He didn't talk about race in that ayah. He said, anyone from among you, the best amongst you is the one who has, the most noble amongst you is the one who has the most taqwa. So Allah was trying to put everyone at a, at a, a level playing field. If you have more taqwa and you have more um, uh, fear and consciousness of Allah in your daily life, then you are the no, most noble of people. <clears throat> To give you some more specific examples of, um, of women at the time of the Prophet I want to throw out a few stories for you. And so we have um, the story of, uh, of a, a number of women who actually worked at the time of the Prophet They were actually women who had careers, as opposed to the idea that a woman should um, just be at home. If she wants to be at home, then give her that choice. That is what Islam calls for. It, it, it calls for the choice for people to have. The, the responsibility of the, of, of the finances lays on the men. That is what Islam calls for. But if a woman chooses to go out and work and have a career, then Islam does not forbid that from her. That does not forbid her from that. And the reason we have examples is to show us that there are role models that we can follow. And so we have the example of, for example, Zainab, which is one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, she actually used to go, she would create little, um, little crafts or trinkets, they'd call, they call it like a craftswoman at that time, she'd create these things, and she'd go to the market and sell them. She would go to the market, to the soup, where there are men and women, and she would sell these items to them. She was a businesswoman. We also have the example of the wife of Ibn Mas'ud, the very, very famous uh, Sahabi, Abdullah Ibn Mas'ud, his wife was actually the sole breadwinner of the family. It was known that he was poor. He came from a poor background. She, she, she was the sole breadwinner of their family. And she would uh, provide for him, their own family, and even for the orphans that she took care of in her home. She was the sole breadwinner in that case. And there's a famous hadith where we talk about that the wife of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud asks, the, asks Bilal to ask the Prophet Sallallahu that can she give zakat to her husband? because her husband just, he, he doesn't have enough to even manage. And the Prophet ﷺ allowed it in that case. We have the example of a woman who actually owned her own farm. And the story, it's actually of, of the aunt of Jabir radiallahu anhu, a sahabi. The aunt of Jabir radiallahu anhu, he, uh, she owned a farm, a date palm tree farm. And after, uh, she, when she was in the Idda period, meaning, um, and I can't recall the story whether her husband passed away or she had been divorced, but she was in that Idda period, which is about uh, four months, where a woman is not 
really supposed to go outside. She's not really supposed to go outside. She's supposed to stay in the home as much as possible. Now, in that time period, Jabir asked on her behalf to the Prophet ﷺ, can she go out to tend to her date palm tree? She is the owner of a date, date palm tree farm, one. Number two, she has people working under her, employees who work in her farm, and she just wants to go out and check that everything's going okay. And the Prophet ﷺ allowed her. So not only was she allowed to leave in her Idda period, we see that she is a woman, a businesswoman. You could say she's a CEO, owner of a farm, and she has employees under her that are working, men and women who are working under a female boss. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't forbid her from going to her farm even in her Idda period, even in her Idda period. We also have an example of um, two women who they used to make, um, they used to make uh, the etar, the perfume, they used to make etar, they would make the combinations, and they would make the etar, and they'd go out to the market and sell it. And there are many examples of women who were out in the market selling. They were out in the market selling, business women, entrepreneur, entrepreneurs. We have the example of, um, of um, a woman who actually, uh, it's really interesting to hear this story because this was at the time of Omar ibn al-Khattab. So at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, when it was his caliphate, he, um, he decided that he wanted someone to police the marketplace. So he wanted someone who knew the rules, the fit of business transactions, and he wanted someone to go and, and walk around the marketplace, make sure no one's monopolizing a certain product, nobody's cheating, you know, nobody's doing, and nobody's making any bribes or any sort of business interaction that's not um, allowed in the Sharia of Islam. So he decided to, to see from his community in Medina who would be the most fit for this position. And who was most fit for this position other than Shifa bint Abdullah radiallahu anha, a female who he felt knew the most about the fiqh of business transactions, a female. She knew the most about the fiqh and the sharia that had to do with business transactions that he appointed her as the policewoman of the souk. So she would go around with her stick and she'd walk around and if something, someone was doing something incorrect, she'd tell them that you're doing this incorrect and you're going to be reported. She was the first policewoman, you could say, of uh, the Muslim Ummah and she was a female. And she was chosen because she was the one who had the best, um, she was the most qualified for this position. What's interesting is, after this worked out pretty successfully in Medina, Umar radiallahu anhu also wanted to put uh, a place, a uh, police person for the market in Mecca. And who was the most suitable for it except for Samra, another female. And so the two police women of the Muslim Ummah at that time were both females because they were the most qualified in the knowledge of, that, of the business transactions. And so if we say, if we have this idea that Islam says that women are not allowed to work, or if they work, they should not be in a place where there are men, or if there are men, then she should not interact with them. What do these stories that you've just heard show you a picture of? These were women who were qualified women. They were, they were working women. They were business women. They were police women. There's even more stories than that. You have the story of um, a woman who was considered like the nurse of Medina. She was the one who knew the most information. She learned from her father the information of the different herbs and what this one does and what that one does and what medicinal purpose this and that has. And so people from all over the city, both men and women, would come to her for medical advice and to dress their wounds and to, to help them out. What medicine should I take? What herb should I take? Essentially, she was the first doctor of Medina and she was a female. And nobody said, oh, but because she's a female, I can't come to her. No, they came to her because she was qualified in the information, in the knowledge that she knew. There's even um, um, the example of a muftiya at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. What do you, what, have you ever heard the, the title muftiya? Muftiya, with the A at the end? Okay. A mufti, we've heard before. Mufti is someone, a male, who is qualified in the fiqh and in the sharia, to issue fatwa, to issue rulings, right? We actually had a muftiya at the time of the Prophet ﷺ and after his death, the most famous muftiya. Do you know who she was? Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. People would come from all over, not just Medina, not just Mecca, from all over the Muslim ummah. They would come to Aisha radiallahu anha to get fatwa 
to understand like this is the issue I'm having between you know myself and my wife. This is the issue that's happening that happened in the marketplace, or this person did this to me. They would come to other Sahaba, but eventually, if if the other Sahaba couldn't figure out the answer, they would come to Aisha radiallahu anha, and she would rule in their cases as a judge over them in some cases. And there's even entire there's an even an entire book written. And it's called the corrections of Aisha radiallahu anha, meaning that other Sahaba would also give their own fatwa or issue their own. Uh, they believe that this is the answer according to the Quran and Sunnah, and then they'd go to Aisha radiallahu anha, and she, being one of the most knowledgeable of people, meaning because she lived with the Prophet sallallahu she actually heard from his mouth so many narrations and hadith. They'd come to her, and they would she would correct them. Say, oh, you actually thought this is what the ayah meant, but I heard from the mouth of the Prophet ﷺ that this is what the ayah meant. So there's an entire book written on the corrections of Aisha radiallahu anha of what other sahaba had said or ruled on. So she was a muftiya. She was a woman who knew her deen so well that people from all over the Muslim ummah would come to her and seek counsel and seek guidance. Interestingly enough, there's even the story of a woman who was on the battlefield with the Prophet So at the Battle of Uhud, at the Battle of Uhud, this was the battle where um, the Prophet was actually harmed. He actually bled. The enemy was able to, to hurt him. And so in this battle, he says about a certain woman, he says, when I look to my left and when I look to my right, there she was, Nusayba. Nusayba, there was Nusayba defending me from the army. So he'd look to the left, and someone was coming at him, and Nusayba would fight them off. And he'd look to the right, and someone was coming at them, and Nusayba would fight them, out, and fight them off. This was a female in the battle of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, And he said about her after the battle, how can anyone be as brave as you? How can anyone be as brave as you? She was a female in the battle, defending the Prophet Wasallam. Never did he rebuke her for what she did. Rather, he glorified her for the, for the courage that she had and the bravery that she had defending the Muslims against their enemy. The Prophet ﷺ, even in his masjid, he delegated tasks to women based on their capability. And so we have example of um, when the Prophet ﷺ wanted to create the mimbar, just like that right there, where the khatib stands. Where the khatib stands is the mimbar. So in Medina, after they built the masjid, um, late, later on, the Prophet ﷺ decided to have a mimbar built. And so he asked the community who would be the best person suited to have this member built. And the community came back with the name of a woman from the Ansar. A woman from the Ansar. The Prophet ﷺ didn't like, uh, you know, hesitate and say, oh, but she's a woman, this is affair of the masjid, you know, masjid affairs should be with the men. No, he said, well, if she's the best one to get the job done, he delegated the task to her. And she, with, she had contacts. She was, you could say she had like a carpentry business, you know, so to speak. And she had her uh, carpenters build the mimbar of the, uh, of the, the masjid of the Prophet And so he didn't look at people based on their gender that could they do this or could they not. He looked at their skills, their qualifications, he looked at what they were able to get done and, and, and he used them and he um, used, utilized them in his masjid for the purposes that he needed. We even have the example of the woman who was the t caretaker of the masjid. Her name was Ummu Mahjan. Ummu Mahjan was an Abyssinian woman who was the caretaker of the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, meaning the one who um, takes care of it, she cleaned it up, she made sure that you know people who were not supposed to come in were not coming in. She was the caretaker of the grounds. She was a female. And the Prophet ﷺ, when she passed away, um, the rest of the community, they prayed janazah over her, but they didn't notify the Prophet ﷺ, so he didn't know that she had actually passed away. And so a few days pass, and he notices her absence. And so he asked the community, where is Ummu Mahijan? I haven't seen her for a few days. And they mentioned, oh, yeah, she passed away. We prayed the janazah over her a few days, a few days ago. And the Prophet ﷺ was upset. He said, did you not think that this was important for me to know? That the caretaker of my masjid has passed away? He was so upset that they didn't think that this was important information. Maybe they didn't think that she was someone of so much value that it should be announced her death. 
But the Prophet ﷺ thought that she was a valuable person in his masjid, in his ummah. That he went, even though they had buried her, and they had already prayed Salat al-Janazah, he went to her, to her grave, and prayed Salat al-Janazah upon her by himself. This was the value that the Prophet ﷺ gave to women in his lifetime. This was the value that Allah had taught him from the ayat that were revealed, that that was the value that he should have given to the people in his community. And the people understood that. And the people abided by that. Even so, to the point where um, when Uthman radiallahu anhu, when he was, uh, when, when it was the time between um, uh, Umar radiallahu anhu and Uthman radiallahu anhu, they had to make a decision of who was going to be the next Khalifa. So Umar radiallahu anhu had passed away. And Umar radiallahu anhu had appointed six people to be on this committee to decide who the next Khalifa was going to be. Okay, so he appointed six people to be on the committee. What happened was from these six people, well, one was out of town at that time, so he wasn't a part of the committee anymore. Uh, two of them backed out and said, I give my vote. One gave their vote to um, Uthman and one gave their vote to Ali. So we're left with just three people. The, th the third person also backs out and he says, I I'm not going to be the next Khalifa. This was Abdurrahman bin Auf. But he says, you know what? Between Uthman and Ali, I think they're great candidates. What I will do is I'll make the final decision. I'll make the final decision. But he didn't just sit there on, on the spot and, and, and make the decision. What he did is he took a couple of days and he went to the homes of the Sahabi was Sahabiyat. Sahabi was Sahabiyat. To, to, the, to the homes of the male and female companions knocked on their door and said, who do you think would be a better leader between Uthman and Ali? He essentially created the first election of the Muslim Ummah. And in that election, he thought it was important to include the females. So he took the votes of the men and the women in the households. That was what the Prophet ﷺ had created. That's the environment he had created for them. That was what Allah, when, when Allah had revealed the ayat about women, had, had raised their status, that is what they believed was to be done. So even when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, they continued valuing the women, valuing their opinion, giving them a say, giving them a right, giving them a right to vote in this case for the next election of the Muslim Ummah. And so when we come today in 2017 and find that people are saying, a woman shouldn't have a vote on a masjid shura about where the bathroom should be in the next masjid we create. How important is that concept and how important was the concept of who the next khalifa was, right? If we were, if women were given a vote at that time and that was what they thought, they thought that it was valuable to get the woman's opinion on the next khalifa, then surely there should be no problem in getting the women's opinion. And not only should it not be a problem, it should be vital that we do get the opinions of the women in our masajid in our organizations. We should give them a voice as the Prophet ﷺ did in his time. In the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, women were given direct access to ask questions and answer questions to the Prophet ﷺ, to their imam. And so there's a narration of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, um, that he walks into the masjid and he says, um, I, I walked into the masjid and I saw two rows of men and one row of women. And then he double takes and he says, Okay, maybe it was two rows of women and one row of men. And so, what does that tell you? Again, this is one of, what, this is one of the hadith that gives you some insight into what their lives really were like. You could just, you know, not, you know, not pay attention to that part of the hadith. But what that tells you is a man walked into the masjid and he was able to see both men and women in his masjid. And not only that, it was insignificant to him whether the women more, were more or the men were more. It was a normal thing that there were a lot of both in the masjid, in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, and we'll move on with the hadith. So he goes and he says, we pray, the Prophet ﷺ leads us in prayer. And the Prophet ﷺ then turns around after the prayer and he asks a question and he addresses it to the men, to the men in the first row. And the men do not answer the question. And so then he looks beyond and he addresses the women who he can see in plain view because it's a masjid with no barrier. And he asks the women a question and one, one of the women answer the question. And so in the masjid of the Prophet he had set a precedence that women and men can both be asked questions. They have access to their imam to ask questions, to answer questions, to get problems dealt with. 
That was the kind of access that we are given precedence in our masajid. But is that very, is that any way similar to what we see today? Unfortunately, no. In many masajid, um, not only are women not in the same place, there are many masajid where women are put away in a different room, or even, unfortunately, in some countries where women are not allowed in the masjid of Allah at all. In some countries. Um, I actually come from a country where it was like that when, when I was growing up. Um, not probably what you're expecting, but I grew up in South Africa. And in South Africa, um, they, for, for the beginning parts of my life, women were not allowed into the masjid. We were not allowed into the masjid. We didn't feel like it was... Even if I talk to my cousins today, I remember my cousin, my female cousins, um, I, I just recently visited them. They said that when they would pass by the masjid, they would run. They would run quickly because they were afraid. All they were taught all their lives is, this is not somewhere where you're allowed to go. And so they would go hurriedly past the masjid in fear that if they were even seen in front of the masjid, they'd get in trouble because that was not a place for them. What kind of relationship does that create in the hearts of women for the masjid? And if the masjid is where the Islam is taught, where people are taught their rights and their deen, then what kind of relationship does that person have with their deen? And if we're saying that, that the mothers are one of the biggest, uh, the, the, the most important teachers for their children, both mothers and fathers, but in many times the mothers are, are more, uh, have more time with the children. If they're not allowed in the masjid, they're not allowed to learn their deen, they're not allowed to learn their rights, so what will the children learn? What will the next generation learn? And so we have to change our perception of how the women were at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, how the rights that were really given to us are very different from what we see, how, how we see them played out in society today. So, I've given you a little bit of an idea of the women in the seerah, but there are actually examples we see from the Qur'an itself that also give us sort of this interesting picture, different from what we'd expected. And so in Surah At-Tahrim, Allah talks about two examples. He gives us the example of the women who are successful, and He gives us the examples of the women who are not successful. And so he, he gives us this, um, the, these two people on different uh, sides. But it's interesting what he talks about these women. So the first set of women who are not successful, he mentions the wife of Lut and the wife of Nuh okay, So he mentions that these women were not successful. That you know, even though they were the wives of messengers, Righteous messengers of Allah, Nuh and Lut they were still judged, they were still held at an individual account. So when they disbelieved in the message and they um, went, uh, you know, turned on their backs, turned uh, from the message and from what their husbands had taught, they were still considered failures. They were still considered those who did not succeed. So it wasn't their appendage to their husband that gave them any status. Allah says no they were they were treated individually which tells us which gives us which gives us at least some understanding that we are individually looked at by Allah we're not appendages to this man or this person we are individual are um, it says the the men get what they uh, ma what they have put forth that's what they will receive and for the women for what they have put forth they will receive and so we, were, we are seen as individuals. And then the second example that's given is the successful woman, which is Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, and Maryam, the mother of Isa. Isa. Asiya, even though she was married to one of the worst men of all of mankind, she's married to Fir'aun, an oppressor, a valim, yet she turned out to be someone who, inshallah, is in Jannatun Firdaus. And she is asking Allah to make, make a home for me close to you, Ya Allah, in Jannatul Firdaus. The, regardless of the fact, regardless of the fact that she is married to the worst, one of the worst of mankind, Allah, Allah uh, judged her individually. So we all have our own individual judgment. We are all individuals working on our own. We're not necessarily 
appendage to someone and we will, you know, we are, whatever they do, we do. So if someone is, is down here on the spectrum, we have to remain down there. Or if someone's up here, necessarily we will be up here. Everyone is judged individually. And that is what Allah was trying to teach us in the Quran. That, that the women are not property. You inherit them and then they get the, the good deeds of you or the bad deeds of you. No, they're not property. They're individuals with rights, with their own ability to do good and bad. And so regardless of who they may have been appendage to in this life, the wife of so-and-so, the, the mother of so-and-so, they, were, they, were, um, they would be judged individually for their own actions. Allah also mentions in the Quran, we have um, the... This Surah Mumtahana, Surah Mumtahana talks about how when um, when the bay'ah was given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or a promise was given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that that they would give him protection, then it is said that it, is, it was the the men and the women from the Ansar who gave this bay'ah to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam considered that the women should also give bay'ah to him, that the Ansar were going to give protection to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was important. For, for this to be noted down in history. It was important for this to be noted down in history as well. And so we see in the story of the, 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 the ahadith that we learned, in the seerah of the Prophet even in the ayat that were revealed to us, that the story of women in, in Islam is very different from perhaps what we've been taught a lot of our lives. And it's important that we go and learn this narrative. Not only learn this narrative, but then teach this narrative. Teach this narrative to our families. Teach this narrative to <coughs> others. Because once you know, and, and that's one of the beauty, beautiful things that I learned um, after, after studying Islam for so many years. A after I, well, before coming to, uh, moving to Malaysia. So my husband and I, um, we moved to Malaysia for four years to do a degree in fiqh and usul al fiqh. And I thought before coming to Malaysia, I thought when I go there, I'm going to become very strict and rigid, and and that's going to be this is going to be the um, uh, you know the epitome of becoming someone who's learning. But actually, the contrary happened when we came, went to Malaysia and learned things that we you know we thought were you know never occurred. We never thought you know women were like this or that certain issues were like this. We actually learned so many different opinions. Of, of different scholars, it, it showed us the rahma of the religion. And so learning more actually just makes you realize that those who were very strict and very rigid, you know, before, those were probably people who just didn't know as much. They, they maybe, maybe only learned a narrow narrative of women. And it's not, we shouldn't say that those people are blameworthy, that, that they are evil and trying to put an agenda for it. That was us, you know, that was me four years ago. That's all I thought that was about women in Islam. That's just what we've been taught. So it's upon us, those who learn it, those who learn more about our religion and learn the, the rahmah that is in our religion, the mercy that is in our religion, then to go back and teach others. And if you don't have a class to teach others, then even if it's just to your children, even if it's just to your friend, just to your husband, just to the people in your family. That at least is one way of getting this message across and slowly, slowly inshallah, changing the dynamics of how women are seen in Islam. Because the, the status quo, the way it is right now, it, it's unfortunate and it's causing many problems for our Muslim Ummah. And so what you'll see is, many times Islam comes with a middle path, right? Islam is supposed to be a middle path. It's supposed to be neither too extreme nor too liberal. And we see when we go when we go to one of the two extremes, problems happen. And so when people have gone to one extreme of being very strict, like not allowing women into the masajid, with good intentions, perhaps, good intentions, we're going to stop the fitna from happening. Well, what is the result of that? The result of that is generations of women who are not allowed into their masajid, who don't know their religion, who don't spread it to the next generation, and then people who don't know about Islam very much at all. And I, I have one example of that that I, that I, um, I encountered a, a, a student, a fellow student in uh, Malaysia, and she was from Afghanistan. And she said in Afghanistan, she had never been taught her religion except from her mother. Never was she allowed into the masjid to learn about her religion. Never was she allowed into a madrasa or an Islamic school to learn about her religion. That was only reserved for the men in her family. 
And she said her mother was the same, that her mother had not learned the religion from the masjid. And so her mother is teaching her the very limited knowledge and passing it down to her daughter. And she said, I had to come all the way here to Malaysia, to a new country, to finally learn my religion. And this is a 19, 20-year-old woman who has not learned her religion yet. She was sitting in the classes and for the first time hearing about um, uh, how to properly pray salah in jama'ah. She had never prayed salah in jama'ah with a congregation. She had never done that. So when they were reading out loud, it was strange to her. This is the first time she had learned about it. And so when you go to one extreme where you're being very strict, you are depriving people of their religion. You're depriving women and then in result, ch the children and the next generation. And perhaps even though they were trying to do something good, it may lead to something evil. That is why Islam's always been the middle path. It knew what was right, right in the middle and what would accommodate all sides. The other option, is, the other extreme that happens is extreme liberation to the point where, and what we see today is, is masajid that are made only for women, and then we, they implement actions that are not suitable for women. For example, women leading men in salah, or women leading the khutbah. And if you were to learn Islam traditionally, you would learn that those things are not allowed, and those things are not a part of our tradition. But we would say that that is not necessarily a justified reaction, but that's definitely a reaction from this extreme, right? If you push women out of the masjid and they don't feel like they have a place, or you push women out of society, so they will go to the other extreme. And that is why we have the model of the middle path, where the Prophet ﷺ had masajid where women were welcome and valued, where he had societies where women acted naturally within the bounds of the sharia, so that was where the middle path went, they, they acted and talked and, and dressed within the bounds of sharia, but they were able then to work and have a career and gain their own money and do with what they please with the, their own money. When you go to either extreme, you have problems, but Islam is the middle path and it came with a solution that was, that was suitable for not only then, but for all times. And so, um, I want to just conclude this by telling you guys that the, you know this is th this is the true narrative of women in Islam, and there are so many topics. There are so many topics um, along this line of women in Islam that perhaps we haven't heard a lot about. And so I want to open up the floor to you guys now. Um, inshallah, this will be a, a monthly class that we're, we'll be conducting here, um, the first Saturday of every month. And so I want to get from you guys ideas of what you'd like to hear about. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of different topics in, in fiqh, in sirah, in history about women. And perhaps sometimes you feel maybe awkward or nervous to ask these questions to, to a male imam.